Hey guys, I wanted to share an interview that I was asked to do back in December of last year regarding the Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin SV split. Uh, we cover a lot of topics. We cover kind of strategy, maybe some of the strategic thinking behind Bitcoin SV and how at the time I was thinking uh, there were a lot of minds in the Bitcoin Cash space who hadn't quite accurately identified the profit motive of the uh, SV crowd. Uh, we talk about some political dynamics and analysis, some long-term big picture thinking about um, the relationship that miners might have with governments. We also cover near the end uh, talking about Phil Wilson's story with regards to Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, it's a good interview. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope it creates value for you. I think there's a lot of information in here that's still very relevant to some of the discussions taking place in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV world. All right, enjoy. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, wanting to have this talk with me, Steve. Sure, my pleasure. Um, I don't know too much about you. Um, I am more interested. I, mean, I, I know you're kind of doing a lot of philosophy, but I am particularly interested in the stuff that has to do with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, it's it seemed like... Um, you know, most people in Bitcoin, they're so close and uh, they're mainly talking about the technical aspects. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to find people that are a little more agnostic, that, uh, that seem to be standing, you know, observing from a little farther away mm -hmm. and are and are kind of looking at like the total, the complete picture. Yeah. To me, I find that... Uh, at this point, I don't find the technical questions that interesting anymore. But what I find very interesting is like, if this is going to go global, like how is society going to change? Mm. Um, is society going to change? Is this going to go global? Like, is it a guarantee that it's going to be a success or not? Like, those are kind of questions that I'm interested in mm. uh, to talk about. And that's why uh, I'm glad to have a, a com this conversation with you. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, I agree with much of what you said. I think these are, in my perspective, these are more important than the technical questions is the big picture stuff. So, uh, first I want to commend you for recognizing that even the big picture matters, uh, because unfortunately I think in the Bitcoin world right now, there are very myopic people that your average Bitcoiner tends to be very myopic and only look at what's it particular technical details right in front of him and misses actually what I think is a much bigger phenomenon taking place in in the world with Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you think you could quickly tell us the story of how you first got interested in Bitcoin? Sure. Yeah, so uh, it was many years ago. Um, I I don't remember the exact date. I could probably figure it out by the price, but I remember when Bitcoin was around a dollar, the first time I heard about it. I think I heard about it at an economics conference, uh, Mises University, many years ago, maybe 2010 or 2011, something like that. And like everybody else at the time, I was like, yeah, whatever, it's a novelty. And I saw it go up to like $10 or so, and I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And uh, I think at the time, if I'm not mistaken, my wife, Julia, said, she also heard about it, and she said, hey, you know, we should get some of that Bitcoin. I uh, lost you there for a sec. Oh, okay. Could you repeat your last sentence? Yes. So um, I saw it, it spiked up to about $10. And my right. wife said, hey, you know, I heard about this Bitcoin thing. We should get some. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it's a cool idea, but it's like way overvalued. Like I've seen it at a dollar and just spiked up to $10. So I said, I will just wait. We'll just wait for it to come back down to a dollar. Maybe we'll buy some. Um, yeah, and that didn't happen. <laughs> So then it spiked up again, and then it spiked up again, and it spiked up again. So it was wh whatever time frame was around a dollar, um, that's when I heard about it. I was originally interested just purely for the economics of the whole thing. The idea of sound money is incredibly important uh, from a big picture economic perspective. And from a political perspective, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. I'm a pretty hard-nosed libertarian. Um, I love the idea of private money that is... Uh, sound. I think that's one of the biggest, most important economic. What do you mean by private? By private money, you mean money that belongs more to the people and less to the government, or? or? I mean, uh, not issued by state decree, so not right. not fiat money. Um, right. 
So yeah, and I, I guess I that's about I've always been interested in that, and I uh, I wrote a book about. Uh, it, people were asking me about Bitcoin, so I figured, okay, I should just write a book about it. I think that was the end of 2014. It's called What's the Big Deal About Bitcoin? And it's just a very simple introduction, the basic concepts for what the thing is, not the technical details. Um, and that did that, that had a pretty good response. Um, yeah, and I've been, then I've been watching from the sidelines somewhat with horror for the past few years. Um, I think, in my opinion, the failure of Segwit2x, um, one of, if not the biggest um, historical event in Bitcoin to date. I think the fracturing of the community around that, the, the, the way that the power dynamics changed after the failure of Segwit2x um, upsets me because I think we're still reeling, we'll, we'll be reeling from that for quite some time. And, and the whole, the whole block size debate, the, the amount of years we lost in actually progressing this community and the economy is just, it's just a tragedy. Okay. Um, after you heard about Bitcoin in, that was probably in 2010, the beginning of 2011, um, how many years did it take you before you download the software for the first time and played around with it? Or was that straight away? Well, what do you mean the software? <laughs> you, like well, a, uh, okay, I, in those in those days, that would have been just a Bitcoin Core client. Yeah, Bitcoin QT was the was yeah. actually the thing that I still use because I what the stuff I set up back in the day, I figured I have no reason to change over. Um, I I don't know uh, from the first time I heard it. Gosh, I don't know. Probably I would say it's at least a year, maybe more, maybe can, two years. Can you remember the first time you started using it for actually making payments with it? I have never used Bitcoin QT or or the Bitcoin Core client. I've only used SPV for payments. Okay, so what what was it when you first start? What year was it when you first started using Bitcoin for or a variety of Bitcoin for payments? Um, maybe twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen, something like that is my guess. And Probably. how was the experience? Fantastic. It was, uh, it was unbelievably easy to convince anybody about Bitcoin because you talk about the economics and the politics and that's one thing and they go, look how easy this damn thing is. Pull up your phone, download this app, boom, boom, and we're done. And it costs cents. And in fact, uh, like my whole family has kind of been involved in Bitcoin. Now, my brother works at Open Bazaar. He's a, he's a, he wrote a book on Bitcoin okay. before I did. Um, we're, I, my, my brother is Sam, Sam Patterson. Um, we had talked to my dad about Bitcoin and, you know, he was on board. He liked the politics and the economics. And then we sold him on it when he, like pretty much the first time he saw how easy it was. Actually, we might have even used blockchain.info back in the day. I don't even know if it was an app at the time that we downloaded on, on his phone or anything. Um, but it was like, check this out. Boom, boom, it's done. He said, oh, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. And you go to the blockchain.info and you see the transaction and there's not, not a middleman. Um, he was converted that way. And then, of course, all well, of that you- fell apart. <laughs> what did you guys find it most useful for? Like, what did you do? What did you buy with it that was most useful? Like, hmm. I mean, in certain situations, I mean, it doesn't really matter uh, if you use fiat or, or Bitcoin. In certain situations, cash money yeah, well, works the best. Faster. So it's like um, you can send a, yeah. a letter through the mail or you can email somebody. So yeah. Pretty much, I mean, I, my wife was working at BitPay at the time as well, so... Um, we were we're not a we're not a representative sample of just like random person, right? Right, right, right. So we were already kind of biased. We're, we were some of the early proselytizers, right. saying, "Hey, guy!" Literally, my wife Julia went door to door in uh, Florida, I think it was, knocking on businesses' <laughs> doors in preparation for the Bitcoin bull. I don't know if, if you remember that thing that happened. I don't know when it was 2013, 2014, 15, whatever it was, um, where BitPay sponsored a college football game, and uh, they before the college football game happened, they were they had a responsibility of signing up a bunch of businesses. So it's just literally going door to door, you know, doing that. But yeah. so and the reason your family was so involved was primarily because of your lib- libertarian. Uh, I would beliefs. say that my brother and I are pretty hardcore libertarians, very interested in economics and sound money. Um, yeah, that that's the start of it. Yeah, that's the fundamental. And. After you heard about it, how long did it take you before you really went into the white paper to get an understanding of the mechanisms of how and why it works? I'd say probably the same. I think it, it was 
that general time frame between when I first heard about it versus when I like bought my first Bitcoin, whatever that was, right, like, right, 13 right. or so. So yeah, maybe a year or two. And at, at the time, it, at the time, I remember it coming up in the context of, you know, you've got the libertarian community, and then you've got the anarchist community, which is smaller, and then you've got like the yeah. cutting edge of the anarchist community, <laughs> which is even smaller than that. And that's where it was being discussed. And it was like, yeah, it's it's not really yet something to take seriously. It's a cool idea, but you know, let's see if this actually has legs. Okay. So. Um... If you have uh, read the white paper and you understand the mechanisms, then the next question I have is, like, how unstable have we made, or is, has the system become by limiting the growth of it? Because it was growing yeah. pretty okay um, up until about 2016, yeah. when it slowed down. In 2017, uh, it went backwards. Yeah. Um, if you know the mechanism of how and why it works, basically um, the uh, the coins going into the supply, Satoshi there is kind of like bribing the miners into mining it. You know, it's an incentive for people to get involved, mm -hmm. but that's only like the first phase. And the second phase is just it being used for economic activity. Right. So enough coins keep flowing through the miners, yes. and then it becomes a self-sustainable system. That's the idea. But if you limit the growth of it by having that one megabyte block size, uh, even with SegWit, I think at the maximum you can do maybe two million transactions a day, then you know um, you don't end up with a stable system. Right. And for any other coin to get where Bitcoin stopped growing might take three, five, I don't know how long. Yeah. And then it's just there. So, you know, you kind of get um, a little bit of a weird system there. Yeah, this is why I say I'm, I'm disturbed and saddened by what's happened in Bitcoin for the last, past few years. The failure of Segwit to UX, in, in, in that I mean the failure to raise the block size on BTC. Um, I, I think it was of paramount, paramount importance. Um, so there's a lot of things to unpack there. One is, so imagine the circumstance in which block size is capped at one megabyte. Well, what happens in the long run when miners uh, maybe don't have the incentive to keep mining if there's not enough uh, transaction fees coming in because maybe people don't actually want to pay $1,000 for a transaction fee. Um, if you, I would put it this way, the, the the block stream scenario in which you kind of take things off chain and you have a small uh, a small group of people that are allowed to access the blockchain, it might theoretically work, right? It's a logical possibility. However, at the very least, it's a completely different system than the one that was envisioned by all the Bitcoiners yeah. essentially in the space prior yeah. to 20, 2015 or whatever. Now, I, not only is it completely different, I think it's a bad idea because we live in a world with competition. So the blockchain that actually is functional and works and you get transactions for a penny or less is going to outcompete the blockchain that works when you pay $1,000 to access it. So I, I think that, I think actually the BTC chain is fundamentally not going to work if I had to put my money on it, which okay. is why I sold most of my BTC. You know? Now, everybody has done so much talking about this. so. Let's try and look into the future instead of yeah. going back into the past. Okay. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about is how do we move forward from here? Yeah. Yeah. Like, what are decent strategies to achieve adoption? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, on one hand, uh, you have uh, Rick Falvinke talking about that our way forward should be through profit mode. We should convince businesses to start accepting Bitcoin payments because they profit from it. Mm. But I kind of disagree with him at this stage because um, to me, uh, Bitcoin got a little bit of momentum, it being used for payments and commerce when uh, Steam and Microsoft started accepting it, mm -hmm. but that momentum was killed. 
And what happened towards the end of 2017 was almost completely speculation driven. Yeah. So that means that there is no network effect of money at play at all. Because when you're speculating with something, that there's no there's no network effect. Um, the other thing it means is that you still have very much a check-in and an egg problem. Because, sure, if the entire world starts using Bitcoin, then businesses will profit. They might have lower costs and stuff like that. But, you know, they're only going to profit if they have a lot of customers making sales. And I would say, on average, any uh, offline store, brick and merchant store that accepts Bitcoin will maybe make one purchase, purchase, have one customer that makes one purchase a month with it, on average. Mm. So, um, and this is um, part of the problem is that we have hardly, we hardly have any metrics to give Bitcoin a proper valuation. We have no idea where its price is at in comparison with the real value it has. For instance, BitPay, they say that they have 100,000 customers, but they're not sharing any data whatsoever. So I've been gathering little tiny bits of data from companies that do, um, uh, that do uh, share their data. Mm -hmm. And basically what you see is the same curve that you see with everything. It's just that little peak in 2017. At the end of 2017, mm -hmm. they had the most amount of sales, and ever since then, it has been dropping. Yeah. So, how do you see how do you see these ideas? That uh, first of all, we have no metrics to to, see, to say if something is really being successful in commerce, or we have very little metrics. And second of all, we are making assumptions talking about the network effect of money. While I don't think that's very much in play yet. And then the last question would be, uh, you know, the profit mode is not really kicking off right now for businesses because they won't have enough customers that have the Bitcoin in the first place, mm -hmm. yet alone wanting to make payments with them. So then the question is, like, what are tactics to get more adoption? Like, um, anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so good questions. Um, so I, I want to start off with what not to do. The worst possible thing that you could do is split the network in two. Right? When we're going from BTC to BCH, we have a minority hash rate, we have a minority of the community, the, the important people in the community. Uh, the worst thing to do would be to split yet again into BSV and BCH, which not only splits the community, it makes the usability and reliability of the network drop that much further, and now there's an even greater disincentive for any companies or anybody to um, get on board and deal with this dramatic crap. That's it. I don't think it's in their financial interest right now to be accepting these cryptocurrencies because, hey, if a powerful enough person wants to shut down your payment network, they can effectively do it, um, and then you're just screwed. So I think. I think the split in the community is horrible. Maybe, maybe even something that won't be recovered from. I'm not sure at this point. Um, however, I don't think speculation is a bad thing. So, it, part of the gimmick of Bitcoin, part of part of its its it brings itself into existence, is that when you have the the price spikes, which took many years of building the infrastructure necessary to be able to convince enough people that Bitcoin is such a big deal that you're going to have a ticker symbol of it on CNBC every day and people are going to watch the Bitcoin price. But that didn't happen in a vacuum. That happened because of the many years prior it was established that this was actually the technology that was going to change everything. So naturally we're going to see we, what we saw, which is this unbelievable spike in the price and a spike in the usage. So if it were only the case that Segwit2x didn't fail and we didn't shatter the network and we didn't completely change the dynamics of the whole damn thing where now it's not it doesn't ink scale with block size increases all of that speculation would be completely justified and the people that bought it twenty thousand dollars in the long run right. would make money but we're not in that sort but now it's state. now it's not justified exactly now it's not justified especially okay. for BTC so however I don't think that's actually a terrible strategy if we if we can actually demonstrate, hey, this Bitcoin 
is the one that works. Like this, this is going to have penny transaction fees indefinitely, and it can scale, and it has all of these properties that the original Bitcoin was supposed to have. I do actually think that's going to be sufficient to draw quite a lot of speculators into uh, BCH or BSV or whatever it happens to be. And I do think that's actually part of the mechanism for getting people to spend it more is when they when they see the price increase that much. And, and historically that has been the case because we've gone through many uh, peaks and troughs and all people spend more as the price goes up and then the usage plummets as the price plummets. So I think that's actually a pretty good mechanism so long as the technical details are, are, are in place and the speculation is justified. You were saying some things about the network splitting again, the user splitting again. Yes. Uh, I want to make a couple of remarks about that. Um, first of all, if you're a business and you're starting to accept Bitcoin payments um, just by yourself, not, without, not, not by using a payment processor, but just by running your own node, uh, just for receiving coins, I don't think it's that much work uh, to flip over between chains or between different coins. Hmm. Can, I, can I interject here? Let me just Yeah, sure. So, so I think that the percentage of merchants and businesses that are interested in accepting Bitcoin cash directly is approximately zero. There's going to be a handful. But it's approximately zero, and the the percentage of people who are going to accept Bitcoin Cash and do the any technical work whatsoever, whatsoever, is is a smaller approximate to zero. So, so I, I think that that is an essentially it, an irrelevant market. What I've seen is that for uh, brick and mortar merchants. If they are going to accept cryptocurrency, they usually accept multiple ones mm -hmm. through a through a payment same processor time. like BitPay. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's mainly true. Uh, but also, um, just by um, you know the 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 shops I was in contact with in Kenya, they're just using apps on their phones and they just have multiple apps installed. Okay, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> I, I have not heard. I would now, I would bet a lot of money. That's brick and merchant stores, but then yeah. online, it kind of depends on what kind of if there is if there is a website that is like digital native, you know they would support one if something like yours would just support one coin. Yeah, because I, that wouldn't be possible for them to to accept multiple coins. I think even now, for point of sale transactions and brick and mortar places, I think you're going to have the vast majority around the world are going to be. Using payment processors, so you may it may be the case that in Kenya, for example, maybe there's legal requirements that I don't know if BitPay offers their services there, but but the actual amount of people that are going to download the stuff well, and keep BitPay care of it, is only yeah. only only BTC and BCH. Yeah. While uh, I'm looking at brick and March merchant store and it says Litecoin, Ethereum, they usually they usually accept five, four, or five or six different how, cryptos. How many of these companies have you seen? This is not. I have no data on it. This is just like this is just like a, a from like watching the news and seeing, uh, uh, you know, uh, for instance, like in Australia, you have a lot of adoption for Bitcoin Cash, but if you look at their screenshots from their terminals and stuff, they accept five or six different cryptocurrencies, and it's the same in Venezuela, and it's the same when I'm for the BCH Pizza project when I'm calling. So far, we have only been in touch with uh, shops that already accepted cryptocurrency and now also accept Bitcoin Cash. So they support four, five, or six. And to them, it's kind of like a little gimmicky because they might, in Venezuela, they probably have the most amount of uh, transactions over it. But in other places, they'd have maybe one or two or three people a month that mm -hmm. come and use cryptocurrency to pay with. Mm -hmm. So for them, because it's just such a low amount, it's so gimmicky. Yeah. Right now, for at least the brick and merchant stores, it really does not. They are gonna accept. And if somebody comes into the store with kind of a weird cryptocurrency, they might just install the app just for this this person. Yeah. Especially in countries that are not in the West, like somewhere in Africa or in Venezuela, I don't think that's gonna be much of a problem for them. So. Um, 
I, I don't necessarily think that, see, to me, um, Bitcoin is the idea itself. So every cryptocurrency that has looked at some of Bitcoin's mechanisms and is using them, some of them or all of them is in a way Bitcoin. Yeah. So people start using that DID spreads, even when it looks like it splinters. Like I feel like our approach within the community of us all getting angry at one another creates a very negative atmosphere. Yeah. But offline, you don't have that atmosphere. You go into like away from the distortion of social media, mm -hmm. you go into places like Venezuela, you will not see you'll not see two people that are paying with different coins start to fight each other. So, you know, this whole atmosphere of, you know, your coin is bad and your coin is a scam. At this point, we really should not care about it. Because if even if a, 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 a less inferior solution would get accepted, if it stops working and people need it to work, you know how like uh, necessity is the mother of all inventions. If people get, if people use a coin and it becomes successful and it stops working, well, they will switch to something that works better. Yeah. So like, so, if, if there, go ahead. if there would be pizza places here that for some weird reason start accepting Ripple. Well, it's still easier for me to convert my Bitcoin Cash onto Ripple and pay with that in a store than it is to sell my Bitcoin Cash for fiat and then pay with it in a store. Yeah. So to me, it really doesn't matter because if, if a store is already accepting Ripple, it become a lot easier to uh, convince them to also accept Bitcoin Cash, which is what I want. Are you seeing my point? Yes. Uh, so there's a few things I want to say there. First of all, I, I agree that especially from the political standpoint and maybe the economic standpoint it is all kind of bitcoin so even if even ripple is ripple is the son of bitcoin well actually if you get the details of ripple that, that might not be true but the uh, litecoin it's kind of the exception because yeah, that kind of, yeah 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 litecoin uh, and stuff yeah. yeah like these are all essentially so it's like bitcoin will scale one way or another right and if if it might be that a way that Bitcoin scales is by being an entirely different chain with an entirely different genesis block. So I do think that's true. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that to the extent we have shitcoins that are being accepted and people are confused about the fundamentals of those shitcoins, it sets back the entire industry by years. Because the people that get burned by accepting BTC, like like, like in the, in the actual world, the fact that we had Microsoft and you had Steam accepting Bitcoin, and then the experience was so bad for them that they said, this is a net negative for us. We're not going to accept this crap anymore. That is so bad that it would have been better for the bridge not to have been built than for the bridge to have been built to these companies and then burned and torched. That sets us all back. So so I I agree that you know shouting at each other online is not a good method, uh, not, not a very productive methodology. But but the I, I don't I think that if we're too uh, universalist, we might be setting ourselves back that much farther, right? I, I and this is why I also don't think it's necessarily long term the worst thing in the world for miners to attack chains. Right, people say, oh, this is self-evidently a bad... Okay, but, uh, can, I, I just want to finish that yeah, particular yeah. thought. So, okay. so, so pe some people think that it's self-evidently like an immoral thing for a miner to attack a chain. Well, I'm not sure that's true. That argument, if you look in the long term, um, it might actually be a moral thing to do for miners to attack chains for the following reason. If it's the case that some of these chains are inherently, fundamentally insecure, then is it better for them to go bankrupt, to fail, Earlier or later? Because if you're building your business and you're building companies in an industry off of fundamentally insecure technology, you're building on top, that just means there's more to crumble. And if you can destroy the whole thing right up front, then you have less, uh, less of a catastrophe later on. So, it's, it, so I think actually the idea of like attacking minority chains if they're insecure, it, it might not be that bad. It might be a good thing for the okay. industry. There's two things that we should separate 
there's the actual spreading of the ID, regardless of the implementation, and there's the actual spreading of the best implementation of that ID. Mm -hmm. So for brick and merchant, merchant stores, um, they are important because then if people start receiving their wages in Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, at least they have a place to buy food with, right? You cannot have something become money if you can only like use it online in a couple of cases. Like the primary use case for money is to pay rent with and to buy food with. That's primarily it. And then you know, everything that comes around that. So um, I agree when it comes to like a big business like Microsoft, they have to put in a lot of work, they get burned, they don't want to go through the trouble of that anymore. But for brick and merchant stores, I think that we're still in a different phase where it really doesn't matter because at any time they could just download a different app and switch. Yeah, I, I'm of the persuasion that in general the small stores don't matter. So uh, They matter for spreading the ID. They matter less than big. They matter for ma making it for making it tangible, and by tangible I mean people actually seeing the process on their phone, seeing a different a customer going in, yeah, using the phone to pay for it. Because from from a perspective of somebody that doesn't know anything about Bitcoin, there's really no difference between paying contactless with your phone. It, an app on a phone is an app on a phone. Yeah, so I think the chronological order is different than the way that I'm looking at it. I, I because I was in this space prior to really any big business. I was in this prior to Microsoft, prior to Tiger Direct. I remember the day, I literally remember when those things happened. It was like, oh my gosh, okay. the, <laughs> we have arrived. So before right. that, there was no small, there was virtually no small merchants. So no. you, you had the big players go in the market and suddenly the legitimacy of the thing was, oh my gosh, this, is, this must be a very, and it's on the back cover, I think, of my Bitcoin book. You appeal yeah. to, why is it the case that Tiger, Direct, Microsoft, Newegg, why are all these people accepting Bitcoin? What is this awesome thing? You can't make yeah, but that But we're case. past that now. Well, there was big, there, it's gone now. I don't think that's true. I think, in fact, the situation's worse, where now the mom and pop sh store says, oh, yeah, that Bitcoin thing, yeah, that was a big old failure, wasn't it? There's a reason why Steam and Microsoft aren't accepting it again. It failed. Maybe in the West, but in, in some countries, it's different. That might be true. That that definitely might be true in circumstances where, you, like in Venezuela, where you have a, a catastrophe in terms of people trying to access money. But I don't think that. Is, I think that's the exception to the rule. So, um, well, I mean, like, if necessity is the mother of all inventions, then Bitcoin is first going to see most adoptions in the countries where their own currencies work the worst. I think that. The idea of cryptocurrency is definitely um, sufficiently distributed uh, and in existence right now, where countries which have don't have access to sound money are going to be using it. And it might look like Dogecoin, and it might be Bitcoin, and it might be Bitcoin Cash. Yes, I agree. But I'm interested in in the rest of the world. Right? You got to have them both. It's valuable to have people that are in Venezuela have access to a currency. 100% agree. That definitely accords with my political bias. But that's not how we get world money. It doesn't go from Venezuela to Microsoft. I just don't think that's the way it works. Well, if you just take like people like us that live in the West, um, we don't only just, in some cases online, uh, do we really have a reason to use Bitcoin? Yes, yes. So this is something that I think a lot of people get wrong in this space. Oh, just use fiat. Oh, the existing systems are great. So the, uh, the, I'm not uh, saying uh, that's uh, your, your position. I'm just saying the, there, so there are real, concrete, huge economic benefits to be gained from big companies in the West using Bitcoin at present, yes. Yeah, but you know those big companies are only going to benefit when they already have the users that want to use it and not necessarily. The user not necessarily so there are supply chain benefits you can really get if you if you're a big company and you have a lot of branches all over the world and you've got to go through the established payment channels to get all your people paid to track all of your packages if you can destroy right. all of that and just use one currency that is millions or maybe billions of dollars on net for all the companies right. that have like international supply chains but then what are all what are all the negatives about them doing that? Because uh, if they just bought some Bitcoin to pay their people with, and the price goes down 20% that day, just yeah. after 
that then it just is so, too risky but, but for here, them. Here's why. So so the people, the companies that are going to do that are not going to want to hold crypto, and they shouldn't want to hold crypto right now because it's too young. The companies that have the incentive to do that are going to get in and out. They're going to use Bitcoin as the back end. They're going to use companies like BitPay or other payment processors. They're going to say, hey, send $10,000 to Joe on the other side of the planet. And they're going to see $10,000 from their bank account go to Joe's bank account. But it just goes through Bitcoin on the back end. Is it already working like that? Because then you're working with another layer in between and then it takes all the properties out of it again. Because but it BitPay isn't ah, operational ah, everywhere. They have to follow ah, the laws, ah, that kind of stuff. But it doesn't. So, so here's why. Here's why. Even So in terms of the purest libertarian Bitcoin, yes, that is a, when you're going through a, a middleman, there is a, you're giving some power to a company like BitPay. However, despite that, you still have a huge economic incentive. Just even if it's a percent less expensive, which I think it's several percentage points less expensive than current channels, even if it's a percent less expensive, suddenly that can be a huge amount of money. So, so can you use BitPay right now to send, uh, you know, fiat using Bitcoin without losing any on it, regardless of what the market does, because BitPay will just observe it? Uh, it. So I will not answer that question because I don't know exactly what services yeah I'm just going to not answer that question I'll just say that uh, if that's not something that they're doing that is something that other companies can do I think what is it bit bit wage or something there's a company out there that has been or maybe it's a uh, I don't know bitgo I don't know some of these old companies offer those services if it's not bitpay in particular but yeah but they do take a cut I mean the thing is the cut that they're allowed to take because the because the economic benefits of Bitcoin are so great, still makes it profitable for really big businesses to put their back end on Bitcoin, if they're international. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, next to that, like, is there any other ideas or things that we can do to start moving adoption forwards again? Uh, well, like to me, what is money is in the mind, and it doesn't seem like it's going to go really fast changing people' ideas about what money is. Yeah, I think it could have. I think it could have. I think the the window um, for this cycle has certainly closed. I, I think actually, it, because it's such a powerful tool for speculation, and and. There's such a buffer zone where really people buying Bitcoin at $20,000 each, if they were buying the thing that worked, if they were buying a piece of sound money, would have a positive return on their investment, which is insane when you think about it. Because if you, especially if you've been watching it since it's been a dollar, right? you've got a 20,000-fold increase in the asset and you still have room to go. So, so the, the promise just of being functional, cheap, stable, secure, sound money in the long run, I think is... I think is sufficient, but but as you said, I don't think it's going to happen quickly, especially given the events in the Bitcoin sphere. I think it's going to take many more years before people realize uh, that there is one scalable big block Bitcoin, or maybe maybe two scalable big block. Bitcoin. So for now, you just see bubbles come and go. So for, like, I, yeah. okay, so for example, uh, let's take Ethereum. So I, Ethereum came out in I think in 2015. If you bought it at a dollar, you could have sold at a thousand like two years later. You've done it a thousand times on your money, which is insane. So do you see that that something like that will ever return again? Yeah. Oh, definitely. No, I, I think... Uh, you I think, think we're still going to have oh, these yes. these insane bubbles? Oh, yes, I do. Oh, yes. I think, I think, I think we're going to have several more. I think it very confidently. Just... Truly, for economic reasons, the sound the the prospect of sound money is so great. Sound digital global money is so great um, that it's going to be irresistible. Yeah. yeah. Then the question becomes: While the market goes down, how do we make sure uh, that Bitcoin Cash is the one that grows in adoption, while everybody else does not grow in adoption? That is the question. Thank you so much for asking it. So. Okay, now so, l let me make a, a couple a okay. couple of remarks. Okay. okay. This is something that uh, I learned from Amari, the lead developer from ABC. Mm -hmm. 
he was comparing Bitcoin to oil. What happens when the price of oil drops down? You have a lot of companies that stop getting oil out of the ground yeah. and the supply goes down. Yeah. With Bitcoin, it's the other way around. When the price goes down, the supply of Bitcoin goes up because miners have obligations. They pay them in Bitcoins. The amount of Bitcoins that are, is mined is exactly the same. So he was saying that whenever the price goes down, now miners have to sell more of their own Bitcoin to be able to pay for their obligations as the price is going down. At these uh, feedback loops, and it's to say it's the opposite when the price goes up. So when the price drops down, the price drops down even more because when the price drops down, the supply goes up. So then Omri was saying, and uh, the counter to that is that. Uh, um, when the price goes up, more people start using it to make payments with. Because the price goes up, they're like, okay, well, I need only I need only a little bit of my stack to buy this with. And tomorrow they need a, need a smaller amount of their stack. Now, there's people that are that are saying that nobody's gonna buy anything when Bitcoin increases in price, but so far we've exactly seen the opposite. Incorrect. Yeah. So far, we've seen the opposite. The higher the price goes, the more sales are being done, the lower the price. Because I can tell from my own experience, I'm making less tips. I've done a lot less with Bitcoin. Yeah. I've made a lot less transactions in the last couple of months, in the last month since it's done. I don't care about 10 or 20 or 30 percent, but this was 80 percent of Bitcoin cash in just 30 days. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. That has an effect on a lot of things. It has an effect on the capital in the community. It has an effect on people that are working and getting their wages in Bitcoin Cash because the people that are paying them, suddenly their stack, if they get paid now, their stack of Bitcoin Cash goes down 10 times as fast as it should be. Yeah. So that's an issue. Yes. So uh, many things to say on that. First of all, on the last point you made, um, I think it would be wise for the entire crypto community to not pretend that we are in the era of stable store of value prices for Bitcoin. We're not right. there. The, the promise, right, part of the speculative value is that we may get there sometime, but we're right. not there now. So I would not recommend anybody take 100% of their wage in Bitcoin yet, or Bitcoin Cash or whatever. We're just, the market's way, 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 way too small in my opinion. I am expecting very concretely there to be multiple bubbles but in front of us, even bigger than you, the last one. You said for BitPay, it would work if they receive fiat and they do everything. In, in yes. To, I mean, when, then when the market is going down, they're losing out of, on, on it because they might not be able to get from the fiat back to the fiat ah, again ah, ah. in enough time for the... So wh why would that oh, be different oh, oh. with people that receive, like, my wage is 100% in Bitcoin Cash right now. Yeah, so, so I guess... So far, it's gone good, except for the last month, when it, it, just it, three days after I got paid, the, the market dropped by 50% in just a couple of days, yeah, so, and I didn't sell. So it depends on what you mean by getting paid in BCH. So I'm saying Bitcoin should be the back end. It doesn't matter. The actual fiat price of BCH doesn't matter um, other than for companies like BitPay that are dealing with these arbitrages. Um, if you get fiat, it doesn't matter if the price of BCH is 90 bucks or 10,000 bucks. Right? Yes, it's true. But within somebody holding it, 20% up and down Yes. Uh, is now if it goes 20% down and in the next one it goes 20% up, it evens out. But when you're going in a market that continues to go yes. down, yes. it becomes a problem. And people that didn't keep that in mind, right. they might run out of money and their right. business might be over because right. they're starting to lose money. I completely it. agree, which is why I think the smart entrepreneurial decision, if you don't have a savings to draw from, is don't hold BCH. BCH right now, if it is being held, is a game for speculators. If you want to speculate, I'm speculating. If you want right. to speculate and you can afford to do so, great. You stand to make a lot of money. Um, but, but here's the thing. Here, here's what I think the economic dynamic is. If you have a reliable back end where you know these, you can get, you, you're in fiat, you transact right. to get the Bitcoin, and then you're in fiat again. And right. you have a stable system that has functioned for a year, right. two years, five years, okay. ten years. Suddenly you go, well, hell, why am I cashing out in the fiat? I'm just going to keep the middleman thing. Right, right, right. So that so that, so that, that is the time when you have the actual 
demonstrated price stability, not theoretical price stability, demonstrated price stability because the system just works, then I think you're going to see people hold a lot more BCH and so they're not going to be taking on as much risk when they do. For adoption then, I should then promote payment processors at this stage. I think that would be an excellent decision, yes. I think payment processing is the whole is 95% of Bitcoin at this moment. It's all paid right. process. It's a, there's a, I think it's also in my book somewhere that, like, that right at the beginning, Bitcoin, and we all knew this back in the day, Bitcoin is a new type of payment system for the internet. That's it. Now, it right. just so right. happens there's this magical thing that drops out of the payment system, which is perhaps sound digital money that you can hold on to. But that's like way down the road in the future. That's Let's scale the okay. system a hundredfold and then maybe we can talk about, hey, maybe we don't actually need to get out of Bitcoin and we don't need to get fiat. Maybe we stay in Bitcoin. As long as you use payment processors, you don't have to do that much scaling though. I don't think that's true. So I don't think that's true because the amount of commerce that can take place for big companies like Walmart, for example, like the amount of transactions that Walmart would put onto the blockchain either for uh, like tracking their supply chain stuff, paying their, their people all over the world, is enormous. Just a company like that, one company could make massive use of a, of a blockchain. But we're talking about payment processors. So you have a lot of companies that deal with have fiat. To, they still have to use payment processors though. Walmart's still gonna have to use a payment processor. Okay, but like if, it's, if, it, if, if, if the benefit is because the flow of money for a big international company becomes easier, but they want to use a payment processor because they want to deal in fiat so they don't have to worry about mm -hmm. prices going up and down, mm -hmm. then still you have this big payment pro processor that has multiple offices. If they are sending the bitcoins over, that might just be one transaction that instead of a whole bunch of small transactions, so you would need less scaling to be able to manage that. Well, that's partly true. That's partly true except it runs into a problem which is what happens when the system works, because that's actually where we were prior to like 2017. The trouble is what happens when it works so well that everybody else wants to actually start using it? Yeah, that's the, We were in that circumstance that you've just described and it was working fantastically well, until we hit the one megabyte block well, limit. BitPay, the biggest payment process, Bitcoin payment process, well, they're doing Bitcoin Cash and, and BTC now. Yeah, yeah. And it took, it took a while, but I think that slowly now people, because their customers can now also more and more start accepting the Bitcoin Cash as yes. the as the settlement oh. where they get if they want to speculate they gonna and they they can they can choose between maybe like eighty percent fiat uh, and twenty uh, percent uh. Bitcoin Cash. Okay, so so let me uh, let me try to maybe answer your question in a in a more direct way. I think that the way Bitcoin Cash could gain popularity is essentially the same roadmap that worked for how we took Bitcoin from zero to one. So it's, except the different, the only difference in the thing is that you have bigger blocks pretty much. But the system was working fantastically well. It, yeah. is a, it, is a, yeah, it is a game plan and a roadmap and the incentives are all aligned and it works spectacularly well and then it ran into an artificial wall. So, so I, think, I think as bad as the damage that was done with reputation to Bitcoin, like with what happened with Microsoft, which is serious damage, I do think in the long run it's able to be overcome. Because if you look, for example, if you look at the commentary of a company, I think it was be Stripe or one of the payment processors said, "Hey, we really, we really like Bitcoin. This is an exciting idea." And then when they stopped using Bitcoin, I think it was Stripe. Don't take my word for it. It was something like Stripe. They said something like, "We're going to keep an eye on the crypto industry, and if we can get like." stable networks where there aren't high transaction fees, we're going to probably get back into this space. So a smart business like Stripe or, or, or Microsoft is going to look at the, the technology, it's going to look at the community, it's going to look at the stability of the network, and it's going to say, okay, can we take another risk to get back into this? Because it's inevitable, right? Digital currencies, I think, are inevitable. It's just a matter of when they're going to pull the trigger on it. And I think we could, in theory, do that with Bitcoin Cash, especially because, and last thing I'll say on that, especially because many of the people that took Bitcoin from zero to one are in the Bitcoin Cash community, people like Roger Beer. Okay. These competent entrepreneurs are, were, at least, on one chain. 
why would Bitcoin Cash not be a stable network even if you have somebody splitting off from it every day? Like, I mean, there's no stopping somebody forking it. It's permissionless. Anybody can fork it at any time they want to. Yeah. They just need to have a little bit of hash rate and they can do whatever they want to. So why why is that a problem for like the stability of it? Well, because you, in can't, get, you can't get in and out of fiat when the exchange is closed down. If you're a company that wants to use Bitcoin Cash, right? And you're but gonna... the the exchanges don't necessarily have to close down. I'm it all very depends. glad they did. That was a pot, a real possibility if they didn't for people to lose a ton of money, which would have been an even worse circumstance. I think if there's a if there's a actor on the network that has <clears throat> an unknown amount of hash rate, potentially 51 percent of the hash rate, and they're saying I'm going to double spend exchanges. The exchanges are going to have to close doors. But they don't have an unknown amount of hash rate. Like you can you can calculate this and you can make estimates. And getting the machines themselves is not that much of a problem. But getting the power plugs for them that you don't like it took CoinGeek about a year to get one exa hash of plugs, which is what's this one exa hash? That's about is that 400 no it's 100 megawatts a data center of 100 megawatts you don't build that in a week or two weeks or even a month that takes a year yeah, well okay how do you know that they didn't have a warehouse out there that they hadn't attached to the network yet because you can look that data up on the internet it's very very hard to hide a hundred uh, a bitcoin mining facility that does 100 megawatts even if it's not yeah. even if it's not mining they're just sitting idle yeah, yeah. You can look at what what is what is being uh, built and stuff. Like it's 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 pretty big, 100 megawatts. Like 10, 10, me 10 megawatts is 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 already big. So so, so you've got a uh, you've got a billionaire hypothetically. You've got a billionaire who says I'm going to attack the Bitcoin Cash network and I'm going to buy up a lot of miners to do so. And they attach, let's say. You know, an extra hash worth of mining to the network, and you're saying there's a way to know that they're not there's not a bunch of other warehouses distributed goodness knows where around the planet. Yeah, and most of the hash rate they used was just rented, and there, and it's very easy to so, tell that if you're. So what? What's preventing them from renting more? But, but it's not about them renting more. It's just about them that you can be aware kind of what is going on. I, so, so from my perspective, there's a, I don't. There's think a reason why Bitcoin.com only brought four exa to defend, to possibly defend. I mean, there never was an attack. There was only the rumors of an attack. They never attacked the chain. Yeah, they just I, threatened to attack the chain, and it wasn't. It was. It was okay. four exa. Four exa that they put as you know the rumors that there was going to be an attack, not five or six or seven, because they. It's in, in not was not the hardest thing to make an estimate okay. of how much hash rate they could possibly bring online and they wanted to have about the same. So CoinGeek had 3.75 and most of it was rented and Bitcoin, the Bitcoin.com pool had 4 exa hash, just a little more. Okay, so a few, few notes on this. Um, first of all, I think that it's very likely that BSV was mining um, a chain that they intended to do a, a reorg of a long, deep reorg of um, BCH, but the I think the addition of checkpoints destroyed that. I think they essentially destroyed an alternative chain that was being mined. Um, I don't have any problem with checkpoints. I think the people's talking about it, or they think they're confused about it. It doesn't really affect the dynamics of the system very much. Um, but why but do you think it's likely that they were doing the reorg? You don't think it's likely. But why do you think that that is likely? Oh, I think it's likely because that's their business model. The business model is we're going to be the the one big block Bitcoin and kill the competition. But if you do a reorg, that's that's criminal towards exchanges. Like if you if you do a, a, a reorg of a chain, you're basically attacking an ex you're basically attacking an, an exchange. What do you mean attacking? They're just they're becoming no 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 they're they're becoming the majority hash rate of the network. And they determine what the blockchain is. Because when, yeah, but the difference is between mining publicly or mining a chain in secret. There's a huge difference between it. Uh, if legally, you, you think this is, they would be, yeah. Oh, I don't, yeah, I don't. Absolutely. Well, I mean, legally, I mean, like just 
from a, a common sense perspective. If, if they're no, just no, wait, wait, there's uh, a there's a no, hang on, let me just maybe uh, this might answer your question. So I, there is definitely a difference between mining publicly and mining privately. But I, but you said why would they reorg the chain? I'm saying because they have financial interest to do so. And if the response is well, it would be illegal for them to do so because. Because you're going to tell a judge, hey, look, they were mining, but it's a private chain and not a public chain. I just don't find that particularly compelling. Okay, the difference is this. If they are just like, um, you know, if they have the, the, the most amount of hash rate, uh, then, you know, you know, it's one of the few metrics we can go by. So they would say, you know, they are the original chain. They have the most amount of hash rate on it. They don't want the changes, okay? And you can see that in public, right? When they're not doing that, when they're just mining their own secret chain that they're going to publish later, well, from a from a perspective of an exchange, that just means that all uh, all the money that's been all the transactions that have been made, they get yeah. they get made undone. Yeah. Right. So that means if somebody sent them coins and bought other coins with them and withdraw them, the exchange they still. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in the case of them just like mining publicly with the hash rate and not mining a secret change, then everybody's seeing what is going on. You, that's not that the, the exchanges wouldn't perceive that as an attack on the exchanges. Oh, of course they would perceive it as an attack. I mean, it would. No, they would just mine with more hash rate on the original chain, just in publicly. So 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 then the the ex, the exchanges can just stay with that chain. So I think, and we maybe we're talking past each other. I'm not sure. I, I think that the business plan of get majority hash rate on a minority chain and then destroy the chain, uh, uh, competing chains, is a is a plausible business plan for making a lot of money when you destroy your competition. So, and I think that the threat was substantial enough where exchanges were very justified in halting withdrawals uh, and, and, and if theoretically they weren't this time which I think they were but if theoretically they weren't let's just take the next scenario in which this happens and the person has more hash rate how, how could coin geek have gotten away with still getting any benefit if they would have done a, a deep reorg well how would they how, how could they have possibly benefit from it no no exchange would ever want to do business with them that's not true that's not true. So here's why. Here's why. Uh, the, most of the world does not care about libertarian ethics. So all that it takes is people to realize, hey, if we, if we cooperate with Bitcoin SV, we're going to make a lot of money. Because Bitcoin SV in that scenario is the only big block Bitcoin. In fact, it's the only, as far as I'm aware, the only coin that is trying to scale on chain. But so that's that, a, that, yeah. That would be the case if 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 uh, if if there if all of this was done before there was a split, and they would just mine on an original, like SV made some changes as well, like both of them, like because it wasn't that SV if SV would have if CoinGeek would have just kept on mining on an old ABC client with more hash rate, yeah, there would not have been an upgrade, and then all the and then. They would then decide what Bitcoin Cash is. The the new up, the ABC update would then be mined on a chain with less less hash rate on. But instead of that, they started mining on one that had a couple of changes yeah. from the original chain, mm -hmm. which caused the split. Right. Now they could have mined on just that with more hash rate. Yeah. Not a problem. Sure. But there was a split, regardless. Then for them to use some of that hash rate to then do a reorg on the other chain, mm -hmm. would everybody would know it's them doing it. Mm -hmm. So the exchanges would lose money. Why would the exchanges then still want to list the new coins? Ah. Okay, so there's a there's a few reasons here. Uh, one is exchanges is not a fixed pool of people. Um, two is those exchanges that wisely shut down are not going to lose money, right? So, so it's not the case that the way that a company uh, uh, operates with other companies is they try to be friends with the people and try to play nice. The way that they operate with companies is to say, hey, look, if we work together, we'll make money. 
So I agree, if there was a reorg, there would have been a lot of tears, and there would have been a lot of burned bridges, and there'd be a lot of exchanges and powerful people who would say, screw these BSV people, this is bullshit, and there'd be lawsuits. Okay, that's not the end of the story. So, so what? So people don't like BSV, but then some exchange, I mean, if they are the only big block Bitcoin, there's the rest of the world that's like, hey, I'm interested in, in Bitcoin. This one looks possible. I'm going to buy some of that. And then they're fine. And then there's a profit incentive for those exchanges to uh, offer the service of getting into BSV for the rest of the world. I, I think um, if we would have seen them try to do a deep reorg and then uh, on the ABC chain, people putting more hash rates to reorg the chain back, you know, so you can have a situation where they are mining, I don't know, let's say, let's say they've mined 10 or 11 blocks in secret and they have 51% so they can do that. They publish it, everybody sees their transactions disappear, mm -hmm. then what the other side can do is they still have the old chain, the chain that is orphaned now, right? Mm -hmm. They can put more hash rate on it and as soon as it's longer or has more, uh, as soon as it's, it has more amount of blocks, they can publish it again and it switches back over. Then you have a real hash war. Yeah, and then you have that a destruction have a, in the value of the underlying currency because then you have customers that no, have their balances no, you, disappear and reappear. Yeah, 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 and then of course, and then exchanges exchanges can just uh, just up the amount of confirmations, put it on sixty or seventy or eighty, because as they're flipping, as they're flipping back and forth, okay. they cannot they can only do that within so many blocks. So then you would have then you would have a you wouldn't have the ch the checkpoints, and um, you would have really seen a battle uh, between and you would have yeah, I mean we saw a little bit how much the Chinese miners cared, but uh, you know to me it, it it felt a lot like the way uh, that CoinGeek decided they were going to split. And everything hash war and everything around it was just them trying to scare the other side into doing as much damage as they possibly could. I think the scenario you've just painted out of competing reorgs is terrifying. And for, for the rest of the world, that is a dim if this is a theoretical possibility, they go, okay, I'm not going to use this currency. It doesn't make any sense. If the exchanges have to have 80 confirmations in order to get your money out that destroys the whole idea of it being simple payment system for the internet so that is a but now they were shut down as well anyways during the I, fork i know and that was and the, the confirmations went up and the confirmations yes. on, on sv were a lot higher because sure they were there and still like yes I, I, sv at any time they can do a reorg on their own chain oh are you there Lost you again. Yeah, I lost you for a second. So if Kelvin wants to, he can reorg his own chain and steal from he, exchanges. Why, why would he? No, 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 no. This is where I think there's a, 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 the, the BSV game plan is not well understood among many people in the Bitcoin Cash community. So okay, I can't speak for him, but I see a very clear and reasonable profit motive for all of this. The idea okay. is. The value of big block Bitcoin is enormous. The promise for everybody around the world, everybody who's unaware of Bitcoin and doesn't really give a rip about the politics of Bitcoin, they have a lot to gain from using sound digital money that costs a penny to transact. Okay, So the value proposition, the, the product that is being produced by BSV is sound digital money. That's it doesn't come attached with libertarian principles. In fact, they say they're not anarchists. They're going to incorporate with governments. It's going to be regulated. It's all, the, all of that stuff. Okay. So that's the, that's the product they're producing, the, which ha could go from, let's say, you know, $100 a unit to $100,000 a unit is very possible. Okay. okay. So the way that they become the global currency is by just destroying their competition. In this case, how do they destroy their competition? They demonstrate that the other networks are unreliable. 
They don't have an incentive to reorg their own chain. Their product is sound digital money. They have an incentive to have as many reorgs and as much drama on other chains as possible to say, look at those schmucks, okay. they can't give you sound digital money. Right. So then that brings you back to the fact that it would be in miners in, in everybody's benefit then. That like, for instance, now then it would be in the benefit for the other chain to show, hey, fuck you guys, we can do the same. So, so then you would say that the hash rate... You know, the hash rate from the Chinese miners should just start attacking SV and do no. reorgs and they have more hash rate. Ah, ah, it's interesting. So it's an interesting question, actually. I'm not sure strategically if that's the best thing to do. It's it's not clear to me that's not the best thing to do. But there's another right way around this. So there's the well, we went wrong around SegWit2x. That's when oh, the yes. miners the miners during SegWit2x <laughs> they had the power I know. to put on SegWit2x even though there was this bug in the code or whatever it was, and at one point, whoever it was, them together, they made the decision to play it safe yeah. and allow there to be, because if you if you know how the mechanism works, then if you use the white paper to define what happened, then basically you have two very long orphan chains now. It's like Schrodinger's thing. You don't know if Bitcoin Cash is going to die or Bitcoin core is going to die. In theory, what would happen is one chain dies and that's the orphan chain and the other one continues. Yeah, yeah. That's how the system was designed for it to happen. Okay, now, look man, I'm in 100% agreement with you and in fact, if we play out the scenario of what happens with Segwit2x, the bug doesn't matter. The little bug, okay, people look at it, they fix it, it's no big deal. What happens is the people that were in power, the propaganda artists, and credit to them for understanding how the world works and propagandizing people, um, they, would have be, they would have been destroyed. Because it, it's not just that the miners were in agreement they wanted Segwit2x. It was that all of the relevant businesses, the relevant businesses, wanted Segwit2x as well. So you're, now you suddenly have the miners and the, all the industry that... So why didn't that, it happen? I think Mike well, Hearn well, identified... Well, well, well it's, a, it, it's a fascinating question. I think Mike Hearn got it on the nose. It's a cultural thing. When you read Mike Hearn's when, piece when he left Bitcoin, he said, essentially, the Chinese miners are too passive. They, do, do not, they don't want to rock the boat. They want to show that they're submissive right. to authority, and they view core people as, uh, as authoritative. I think that's correct. And do they still see the core people as authoritative <laughs> a year know. later? I don't, it sure looks that because, way. Right? Because they see to a bigger block size. Nobody would be able to stop them. Uh, so I so here's the thing. It's a fascinating question. I don't know the answer. We're not Chinese miners, but I would not be surprised if Jihan is telling the truth when they asked him why are you mining BTC, and he said it's essentially short-term profits. I would not be surprised if that if the if the well, yeah. the groundwork is laid well, to actually get rid of them. I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. I, 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 it makes a lot of sense to me. Basically, you have all these people that say a lot of nasty stuff about Chinese miners. And then they go on the network and they pay extraordinary fees, and then you get half of that money. So basically, uh, Gian is being paid by his own bullies right now. <laughs> right. Why would he want to change? Why would he want to change that? Well, They're making a lot of money on these fees, okay. and they like money, like everybody else. So, 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 he, 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 so there's a couple things, and then I want to go back and answer your previous question. So the, the first thing is, the way that they can make a ton of money by killing the BTC chain is by uh, selling all of their BTC for BCH. And then suddenly you're going to have an asset which appreciates tenfold, a hundredfold. They've already yeah. done that. They've already yeah. done that because yeah. Bitmain only has twenty-two thousand BTC Is left. The they have a million BCH now. Then I think I think then if I were to speculate and predict their behavior, I would imagine they would see that as it is in their eventual interest to destroy the BTC chain. I think that's what's going to happen. I think eventually we're going to see a proof of work algorithm change. Um, I think the community. I think. I the think there's a strategy of the core blockstream side. I think there's a strategy of the miner side, and I think they're going to essentially part ways okay. in the long run. I don't know, though. We know from the power dynamics that miners will always have the most amount of power uh, in the network, always. I agree. Not the only one with power, but they'll have the most amount of power. I agree. So it's very weird for them to be following instead of leading. Yes, this is it's why. Very weird for, it's very weird for them to be like, basically what we want, yes. we need minor kings. We need yeah. minor leading kings. They're like, yeah. we are what is described in the white 
white paper. Yeah. We are the ones that vote with our CPU power. Yeah. This is what we want. We do this. Right. So, and everybody else has to follow along. Right. So there's two thoughts on that. One is Mike Hearn hit the nail on the head. His right. article was prescient when he left Bitcoin, talking about it's a cultural phenomenon. Two, it might be the case that in the long run, the current miners might be outcompeted by future miners who understand their own power in the system. If it's the case that Jihan doesn't understand, I don't know, I don't know his analysis of the system, then it may be that there is the, the guys behind Jihan who grasps his own power, and maybe that looks like Craig Wright, I don't know. Craig Wright seems to understand That's the power That's what I'm saying, but that would be crazy that we've seen that, that Kelvin is like building up hash rate, but I mean, they, they can't possibly, that, you know, that's, that's, if we have a scenario where you just have, you know, you have a group of miners, regardless if they form a Chinese miner cartel, they're still individuals and the cartel can fall apart. Yeah. And they're not leading. And now you have one guy that's going to get the most amount of hash rate. And now he's going to lead with the most amount of hash rate. Well, you, and we've talked about this in the stream. What kind of system do you get where everybody thinks that it's free and that it's decentralized, but there's one person in control of it all? Yeah, but you get a horrible world. But it's not really one person in control, right? Just it's just one. It's one person who has been able to persuade quite a lot of other people. It's not like he can force Calvin Ayer's hand or vice versa. I'm not sure who's the person in power there, Craig or Calvin. But but, but it's his money and it's his his hash rate. So like. Imagine, okay, so, you know, the, the population starts learning about Bitcoin and starts learning that if you put something on the chain, it cannot change anymore. It's there forever. Okay. So you post a message, you put it on the chain and it disappears because unknown to you, there's one guy in control. And if he doesn't like once in a while, he just removes stuff and nobody knows about it. Yeah. And you go to your friend and you'd be like, hey, I put this message on the chain and it disappeared. And nobody's believing you because it's <laughs> impossible because they all know how Bitcoin works. You put it on the sure, chain, sure. you cannot remove it anymore. Right. Like what a horrible world would we get in? Okay. Like how, how much would the Chinese love to be in control of Bitcoin right. when it, Bitcoin is global? Right. Like they, they're already, Every, all the warfare they're doing with the other nations okay. is through economic warfare. Okay, okay. A couple, a couple things. A couple things here. First of all, short term versus long term analysis. In the short term, it might be that let's say one person has an ex extraordinary amount of power. It doesn't mean that in the long run that's the case. It might be that he is the first entrepreneur who understands the power of the miners, and then other miners will come around, and then there will be competition among miners because he doesn't have the most hash rate in the world, right? He has the most hash rate right. as applied to his. 3% whatever it is, tiny minority right. of SHA-256 hash. Okay, so in the right. long run, I think you do see competition emerge. In the even longer run, I think where Bitcoin goes is competition among nation states. I think this is part of yeah. the long-term Bitcoin analysis. If we're actually talking about global money, which is one of the biggest, most important, most powerful things that has ever been created, if it comes into existence, then there is going to be nation states like China or whatever, who are going to exert influence and try to compete with one another for control of the network. I think that is part of the part of what is going to happen with proof of work and maybe even with proof of stake I too. I feel exactly the same way, and I feel like this is this is the event where it happened. First of all, yeah, so that might be the case. You very, it might be correct. Not necess not necessarily the nation states themselves, but a little sponsoring, a little influence from the nation states. I am 100% sure, okay, uh, China is allowing this to grow because they probably feel like, well, if this be goes global and we can have a lot of control over it, that's, that will benefit us. And I feel like the American companies, Blockstream and Enchain, I think that's kind of the American way of keeping control over it. Yeah. So I already feel like this is a yeah. battle between America and China. Yeah. And it's very interested for two reasons, because there's another clash that's going on. America has a control system that is most accurately described in a brave new world by Aldous Huxley. Where, and China has a radical different control system. So in China, they ban books. In America, they don't have to ban them because nobody would read them in the first place. <laughs> so in China, they keep things secret. In America, they overload you with so much trivial information that you cannot 
yeah. uh, separate the signal from the noise anymore. Mm. So these are two separate control systems that are clashing. And to me, it feels like what we want essentially with Bitcoin is for every single nation state to try and gain 100% control over Bitcoin at the same time. Because if they're all fighting to get 100% control at the same time, that would keep it decentralized. Yes. It's like it's like a game of it's like a game of risk. When you're playing a game of risk with four people and you're fighting amongst each other and one guy is becoming too powerful, then in the benefit That's of you correct. being able to win, the three guys That's have to correct. first break down the power of the fourth guy and then they can start fighting each other again. Right. And then the fourth guy goes, "That's not fair. You guys are cheating." Yeah, you know, I've played risk a few times, so I know that I know that dynamic. So the, the risk you always want to you got to still not, play it. You want to make sure that you're not being perceived as the strongest player on the board. Right. Either through manipulating the other players or whatever it is, but as soon as they perceive you as the most powerful player, they're going to attack and you're going to lose some some power. Right. So first of all, I, would, I want to commend you again for thinking through this deeply <clears throat> um, because I don't see most people thinking about the real long-term implications of proof of work. I, uh, it's an interesting... So here's what I thought you originally meant when you said we may have seen the first influence of nation-states. Um, I don't know who Craig Wright is, right? It's very possible that he also has some state influence from somewhere, right? I, I think that's a real possibility is this isn't just a free-floating entrepreneur out there that he, he might have other connections. I think it's very possible he has other connections we don't know about. Um, second of all, to say that we want nation states to be competing with one another is that's a very big deal if what you say is correct that's a very big deal because you're essentially saying that proof of works long-term competitive market is maybe not among private businesses but it may be among nations so well, nation states will always think ahead of the curve. That's possible. So here, there's another scenario. This is the scenario. This is why I'm holding out hope that Bitcoin is not like the most terrible thing ever, um, because I see a possibility here where miners, as an industry, can be so unbelievably powerful and so sophisticated. Uh, and have so much infrastructure developed that they can compete with nation states. So I think that we could get to a point where like, so let's say we've got you know, a huge amount of hash power in some particular country. If Bitcoin is global, and let's say we're talking about a small country because it's easier with small countries, and you have some um, unbelievably sophisticated mining operation in Haiti, who has the control in that country? Is it the Haitian government or is it the Bitcoin miners? I think I think at some point there if, will be a blend of two, of the two. Exactly, exactly. I think right. at some point there is indeed a blending where you get Bitcoin. You know, potentially start it, put Bitcoin miners who potentially start as private individuals suddenly become so powerful and so wealthy that they sort of become uh, a state among themselves. Yeah. So I think that's a real, a serious possibility. Well, what we should talk about next is the difference between the system when hash rate is inclining and when hash rate is declining. Okay, but before Because there's we, a huge... Before we do that, I do want to return to something you said like 20 minutes okay. ago. My brain has been split because I thought, no, I have to say this. Um, because you said, well, sh strategically should the, let's say the ABC chain attack SV. Uh, there are two ways to make, there are two, at least two, um, ways to try to profit from being the Bitcoin miners. You could be the good guys, you could be the bad guys. Right, the bad guys are the SV side, if you will, right, the dark side. That's going to say we're going to destroy our competition and make a lot of money that way. The, uh, there is another reasonable way to think that maybe the way you make money is by not attacking the other chain. But when your chain gets attacked, you divert hash power from, let's say, BTC to BCH. So you defend the network. You don't necessarily necessarily attack others. And as we've seen, I think, at least in the short run. The defensive approach has won. I, I view SV's attack as legitimate. It's like it's substantial, and they failed because they didn't get enough hash rate. So, if they really attacked, nobody knows that. As far as it looks like, they created a lot of fear, but they never attacked. They didn't mine empty blocks. The chain just split. 
I think that the check, I don't, I don't think that Craig was expecting the whole checkpoint thing. I really think that actually so, screwed him up. Yeah. Now, I've always been of the opinion that it's, you know, it's ethically wrong and not a good idea to attack another chain after they split off. Because if people want to go in a different direction, you let them go in a different direction. Hmm. But I'm only thinking about it that way because of what happened when we had the first fork. Because, yeah, exactly. right? Because we were if, right. <laughs> Yeah, if, if if I mean like I mean it's it's it it would be very uh, it's completely wrong to be to claim that you should kill a minority chain when you are a minority chain right. because then you're basically saying exactly well why why are the BTC miners not just killing us right and if they're not just killing us because they want us to survive well why are they not on our side and they're killing the other chain then right so I mean that's I've only started having that uh, I mean like nobody dies when you do a reorg on a chain or something right. like that I mean from that perspective I mean it doesn't it doesn't matter like, I think the explanation is that there are there are a sufficient number of Bitcoin cash supporters who are mining BTC where the hostile BTC camp would not successfully be able to destroy BCH that's my suspicion so if we go back to the model of a king like well, the king has one very special aspect about him, and that is that he can use violence. But he has to use violence in terms of like him being a just king, right? Using his violence to do the right thing with it in case of, you know, defending or attacking another nation for whatever reason it is. And um, the Chinese miners did not play out that role when we had the original fork. And the short run they didn't. I don't, I hope that in the long, I hope this is just a long game, um, but, but I agree in the short run, I think, which is again why I would recommend everybody check out Mike Hearns. I forget what it's called. I think it's called the resolution of the Bitcoin experiment. Was that I've, I've, I've read it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, where he talks specifically about that idea. But he stopped, you know, he's out of it. He's right. no longer interested in it that right. much. Well, because anymore. he saw this dynamic and he thought, well, this is a failure. If miners don't, stand up for the network the whole thing kind of doesn't work yeah they don't vote if they don't vote right. for what they want then the whole thing yeah right yeah okay well it feels like we uh, think about a lot of things kind of like in a similar way mm -hmm. but you have some differences on <laughs> is there anybody that knows how to move forward like how do you how do you get like massive adoption like okay. I mean like uh, BCH the last year We've recovered some infrastructure, but our amount of TX are not growing at all. Yes, I think that there are only a handful from from just. I mean, I'm I'm not super involved in the community anymore, but I have been getting ever so like ever since Segwit two X failed. What was that? You got disappointed, and you. Well, okay. It's the opposite. Well, I mean, so yes, I, I definitely got disappointed, but I got engaged. Like for a while, I wrote the book, okay. and then it was like, and my wife was working. Right, hey, right. okay, this is fun. Okay. And then I saw the whole Segwit thing, and I was like, well, because at the time, I mean, the whole block size debate's been happening many, many, many years. This was the culmination of it. And when it failed, I was like, oh, shit, I got to get involved in this space again. And I, I, for a time, I was, I was, up until recently, planning on writing. A part two book called uh, "The First Fork from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash." I don't know but, if I can write that anymore in good in good faith. Do you want to just describe what happened, or just do you want to be like, "This is my vision. This is how we should move forward." Uh, describe what happened with Segwit Two X. Well, if if you do any more writing, are you just going to go oh, back oh, in oh, the oh, past oh. and write books and describe what yeah. happened, or yeah. are you going to put out a vision and be like, "Well, this is what we do wrong. Listen to me. This is yes. what we're supposed to do, and yes. these are the reasons." So, so I thought a lot about that, and I feel I I felt more than I do now um, an ethical obligation to explain to people who aren't super deep in the space what the hell happened. And to make the case that Bitcoin Cash is the real Bitcoin, or is the Bitcoin? I would put it this way: Bitcoin. If if I'm to have, so I, I feel like I have some responsibility as an author because there are many people who've read my book and they've learned and gotten excited about this technology, and and I've had something to do with that. So if they're thinking that the thing I was talking about was BTC, they're going to be sorely disappointed. And I feel weird about that. Like, oh, yeah, because I, when I, I use the ticker symbol BTC, because that's the only thing that existed back, uh, back in the day. Somebody reads my book, 
and then sees the BTC network, I'm going to be like, no, 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 there's this other piece that you've missed that's not actually Bitcoin. So I have felt like what I need to do is explain the history of what happened. Frankly, as disgusting as it is, the politics of what happened, because what happened is politics and control and propaganda. I saw it firsthand. Uh, people right. need to be aware of that. And then they, then I, then I can say at the end, you know, at the end of the book, the vision that I wrote about that a lot of people are excited about, a lot of old timers are excited about, is the Bitcoin Cash Chain. That's the same thing. And not the Segway 2x. Not the. Uh, well, there is no Segway 2x chain. No, but what would have been more Bitcoin, or what would have? Oh well, actually, so that's an interesting question, right? I, I don't. The Segway 2x would still be a compromise with the Segway. I, I, I completely agree. Isn't yeah. isn't really needed? Yeah, no, it's an interesting but, question. What was the failure of Segway 2x in the and, longest of runs a good thing? Because now we get unadulterated big block Bitcoin. I I, I don't know. It's a good. And point. Bitcoin Cash kind of put itself into its whole role it has because it yeah. named itself the minimum viable fork. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, bit, what's the, it's what's, what's, the, what's the, what's the work we have to do so we have something that survives. That's basically, yeah. right? So it put itself in, not in a role of a leader, but in a role of a survivor from the very beginning by saying we are a minimal viable fork, a fork, a split that can survive rather than being and that was the cool thing about SegWit 2X. With SegWit, SegWit 2X was to BTC what SV was to Bitcoin Cash kind now. Of, yeah. <laughs> it was this whole threat of, yeah. well, if we don't get what we want, we're going to really buck the shit out of you guys. And then didn't happen. Yeah. And, then, and then Bitcoin Cash has been in the victim role ever since as the minority chain that is just hanging on surviving. Right. So the, the value proposition that I – the whole thing that I saw of Bitcoin Cash is it's just what Bitcoin was supposed to be with the, the most obvious of changes that – the system – put it this way. It is literally true that the system was designed to scale with block size increases. Now, it's an open question whether or not – can it do that successfully? Was it a technical oversight? Was Satoshi wrong? Those are all okay questions. But the system was literally designed that way. If you understand the architecture yeah, of the Bitcoin system, but yeah, we know that, and everybody is going to watch that knows that as well. Like, we I got to move if that's forward true. from. What... I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> People that watch my videos know this. Okay, stuff. Well, that might be the case. Fair enough. <laughs> Look, and this is like, uh, you know, like we got to move forward. We cannot stay in it. Like we yes. cannot keep discussing what has happened in the past. Okay. So, like, we were supposed to have a hash war during the SegWit 1x and SegWit 2x. Yeah. Okay? We would have made it still a compromise. We would have had SegWit with bigger blocks. We could have scaled to 800,000 transactions. We would have been stuck with SegWit. That's not the end of the world. It's still a soft fork. Right. You can eventually screw everybody over that has SegWit coins if you really want to, or you can just keep SegWit. It would not have been the end of the world. Right. Because it would have been an acceptable compromise because you'd still have the bigger blocks, right? Well, I don't know if that's true. Not if it caps at 2 megabytes. I don't think that, that can't scale. Well, if there would have been this hash war and you would have gotten SegWit 2x, then it would have not been a problem. They would have won this war and then it would not have been a problem to go to 4 megabytes. Uh, I, I think that's correct. 8 megabytes. I think in so, practice you're correct. If, if it actually somehow, if it did, I mean, this is something where I realized my own social analysis was wrong. But I at the time, did not think, did not take seriously the idea that the, the proof of social media, which is a good term, could actually have so much power to overrule the 70%, what was it, 80%, 90% of the network that was Segwit 2X, and all of the merchants as well, the businesses. That I that has in and fact that's changed. The reason my, yeah. why is because we do not understand the Chinese mindset, and what we should be doing is we should build bridges with the Chinese community yeah. and learn how they think, how they feel, what's important to them, so that we are on the same page. Because the Chinese people in China that are using Bitcoin Cash or whatever form as money, and I've I've heard conflicting things about the government. So. Yeah. Chinese people say the government is not allowing it to be used as money. Other people say that the government is allowing it to mm. be used as money. When you're talking about proof of social media, well, in China, you basically have a new currency which is your social credit score. Right. 
So we're, we're asking ourselves all these questions, proof of social media, whatever. Has anybody paid attention to what has happened in China in the last five years? Because they are rapidly fast going in a particular direction. Yeah. Like the new guy, he put himself into power for basically forever. There is an immense wave of persecution of Christians again and a whole bunch of other groups. They're locking up Muslims in internment camps. There is something shifting in China at a rapid speed. People are okay with it. They're okay with it. So we're wondering how could he be okay with this? Well, the answer is very straightforward. Yeah. They are living in a system, and I'm not saying their system is wrong, just describing that they're living in the system where their government feels that this is the best way of moving forward, having yeah. the system where the government is controlling how to move forward in a different way than the West is doing it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think it would be enormously beneficial um, to try to get into the Chinese mindset. And, and the thing is, right, it might be the case that it goes so deep that you're talking about psychological, you know, you're talking about the psychological and cultural constructions of China, something like that has a direct impact on the actual mechanics of Bitcoin. Now, just to be clear, I'm not talking about, you know, influencing their minds, no, making them do what we want. I'm talking about getting information about how, yeah, how do yeah. they see it? What do they want? Yeah, yeah. And then finding this compromise so we can together forward. So some of what the things we find important, they take over, and some of the things they find important, we take over. I, I agree. And um, also to be noted is, from my understanding, uh, Craig and the BSV crowd are specifically talking a bunch to miners. Right? That those are the people with the power in the system are the miners. And if you want to understand how the system operates, it makes sense that you're going to try to gain information about what's going on in the minds of the people that have the power. Yeah, the, the Roger Roger was Roger's group was the guy who got the white paper translated to mm -hmm. Japanese, and Jihan's group was the guy that got the, the ah. Chinese white paper the paper translated to China. They basically like together, Jihan and Roger were basically the main influencers of getting this ID to get to to yes. get into into China. Yes, um, and, and 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 now if you if you ask me why Roger Veris hated that much. I don't know, I mean, maybe you don't believe in conspiracy theories, but I am absolutely convinced that there were some people so extremely upset that within two years, this idea moved from the English language into the Chinese language where it was out of their control. It's in a different control system under a different government. I feel like we're going to have this huge clash between these two systems of controls. And if we see that coming, we should make these bridges mm. because if we have this clash you know this is this is from a libertarian perspective this is an amazing opportunity to get rid of a lot of government power and yeah. bring it back to the people both for the Chinese and the rest of the West yeah. have their governments fight each other that'd be amazing yeah. as long as we have these bridges and the Bitcoin is the bridge that connects these people there. Yes. Um, okay. I want to say a couple of things and then unfortunately I do need to head out shortly. Um, but so, okay. Point number one is, uh, are you there? I got a little bit of interruption again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. I just cut out a little bit. Um, okay. Point number one is, People of the libertarian persuasion or the anarchist persuasion, I think many of them do not understand how the world works. And they have a kind of naivete about their own importance. And so the importance yeah. of users, actually, is it would be a case I'd be happy to talk about. Um, the reason I, I think that BCH is not going to fail is because there's a handful of very competent entrepreneurs in the space. It's not because libertarian ethics, it's because Roger right. Veer and Jihan were. Essentially, you take out right. Roger and you take yeah. out Jihan, I don't think there's enough business competence in BCH right now. Well, there's, there's a couple hey. of exceptions, actually. Hey, don't jinx it now, dude. <laughs> uh, there are some exceptions, and I, and I would say the good, the best people are in companies in general.
um, in the Bitcoin space. There's some OGs back in like a Coinbase. And yeah, Bitcoin no, stuff, I, I, I absolutely agree. When I when I feel very uh, depressed, I just look at some very competent players, yes. Roger and Jihan. Yeah, they've invested, they've backed that. Exactly. They have they have patience. They must have yes. some kind of plan. <laughs> yes. They're not sharing it with me, but that's okay. But I can see from where they've put their money where their mouth is. So you know, yes, that's why I'm. Okay. that's why I'm still positive about the success of BCH. Yes, I, I, that's, I'm in the same circumstance. So as much as, as there, there is a flavor of like democracy to libertarianism, there's a kind of the extreme individualism. We like to value the sanctity of the individual. But I think unfortunately that blends into thinking that the individual is always competent, right? Where it's like, it's the, it's the users that determine the value of the currency. No, it's not. In the Bitcoin dynamics, if miners decide that you can't use your currency, nobody's going to value your currency. It doesn't matter. You cannot value majority hash rate into existence. You can't do it. You might think you can, but you can't. Um, however, right. it's also in the incentive of the competent entrepreneurs to provide the service of stable money that you value. But fundamentally, the consumer in that respect, just by demanding something, cannot bring it into existence. As I made an analogy before, um, I said, you know, a man walks into a forest and he shouts at the trees, I would like a television. And there's no response. And so he shouts louder, consumer sovereignty, damn it, I would like a television. <laughs> and go figure, there's no television brought into existence, despite the consumer demand for it. Okay, so, so the reason that's the case is because the way shit actually gets done in the real world is by producers, competent entrepreneurs who are trying to predict the value that people will place on particular goods. They bring it into existence. And then the, then the consumers have the luxury of going to the store and feeling like they have any control over what they're right. consuming. Okay. Right, right. So right. that's a long way of saying when you phrase it as we're bringing power to people, um, and away from governments. I think that is not true in the long run. Or it's kind of indirectly true. And here's what I mean. It's governments are existentially threatened by Bitcoin's existence in the long run. But that yeah. does not mean that they, that they won't be replaced. So I think that miners are going to have so much power because just in economics, the importance of money is the most important good pretty much. I think they're going to be something like oligopolists, or you're going to you're, you're going to have you're not going to have this purely individualistic like uh, atomistic system in which power is effectively distributed and there's like no centralized areas of power. I think what you're going to have is existing power structures which are god awful uh, and like evil. They're going to be destroyed. And they're going to be replaced by ones that aren't perfect. They might be better. They might be along much more libertarian lines. But I don't think the power is going all the way to the people. But that's I don't want that either. Um, and I'm just looking up a post I made not too long ago. Uh, I reposted uh, something that Edward Snowden wrote on Reddit not too long ago. Uh, let's see uh, where they have it. Um, three years ago here and I just want to read a couple of things of this because this was so so true to me um, so uh, we the people will implement systems that provide for a means of not just enforcing our rights but removing from governments the ability to interfere with those rights in such time, I'm just skipping through it. In such time, we'll do it. Remember that at the end of the day, the law doesn't defend us. We defend the law. And when it becomes contrary to our morals, we have both the right and the responsibility to rebalance it towards just ends. Hmm. So I'm just what I'm talking about is we want through force that there be so much influence from the people on government that government changes so it starts serving the people better than currently is the case. Yeah. So this extremism of banks are a scam and let's get rid of all governments, right. that is completely BS. Right. It's completely BS because it took society, I don't know how many thousands of years to get to the governments that we have right now. There's a lot of good in them. 
we don't want to destroy everything. Yes. We want to we want to influence them. So so I I, right? I have some thoughts on that. I'm an anarchist. I'm still um, right now an, uh, an anarchist. That might change in the future, but uh, the way that I'm libertarian and anarchist. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like an anarcho capitalist. Um, okay, right. So the way that I see it is governance will not be replaced. I am totally okay if the existing governments right now um, get destroyed. And, and uh, I do think that's, I, I think it's possible for them not to adjust. I think the, the level of inertia and, and economic inefficiency of existing governments all around the globe is sufficient that they could be destroyed, but in the process of them being destroyed, I think they'll be replaced. Or, or the, the power is going to leak into the hands of what I hope to be more market-driven uh, participants. So, so I think that you know, there's an old, there's a, there's like a, a an old question in the anarcho-capitalist community from Murray Rothbard. He said that you know, the mark of whether or not you're a real, you know, libertarian is if there was a button to press, and you press it, and all existing governments disappear, would you press it? And his response is like, yeah, you would press it immediately, you'd mash it you know, as soon as possible and get rid of all of them. I'm not sure I necessarily feel that way. Part of me does feel that way. Um, but part of me thinks that the system that might emerge could be cool for like a really small number of competent anarchists like who are comfortable defending themselves on their property. But for the rest of the world, I think the chaos that would ensue would probably be a net negative. So much. So actually, and this really, I, I do have to go shortly. But um, I had an interview with Phil Wilson, who I think is a very interesting person in the Bitcoin space, and we were talking about some of the long-term, the long-term vision of where proof of work leads. And he said some interesting ideas about, look, you know, the way you take over the world is not by taking over the world at present. That doesn't work. The way you take over the world is you take over the world of the future. So Bitcoin could be a way for the, the next group of uh, elite government uh, replacements to, um, to gain power. And, and I, I think that is a very likely scenario to have happen is in the long run, governments will be replaced by more economically competent and then um, governance what, structures. Then when you're there, you might, you know, ideally you'd have a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand people in control of the hash rate. That would be but ideal. Yeah. What if you have ten people in control of all the hash rate, and yeah. then it becomes nine because they take one out, and then it becomes eight, and eventually yeah. you have one guy yeah. in control of all the hash rate? What yeah. kind of world would we have then? Potentially a very scary one. Right. This is another possibility that I just think a lot of people overlook. You have to look at the implications of long-term proof of work. And a proof of stake too, because some people think, oh, well, proof of work doesn't doesn't work. It'll be too centralized. We'll just transition to proof of stake. Okay. Well, the way, from my understanding, that proof of stake works is you need a certain amount of coins essentially to add blocks to the blockchain. So what happens when you have the wealthy, powerful nation states decide to invest ten billion dollars in buying up a particular amount of the UTXO set? They it's, suddenly it's have so much easier to get the coins then to get the hash rate that's i think so as well so so like they, proof, proof proof of work is that's it's violence and 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 the, there's a certain amount of like it's it's such a raw it's a raw thing it's brute force it literally is brute force kind of, yeah that's yeah. why it's a great that's why it's a great system yeah so so the idea that okay i would say this in conclusion um the idea that we are going to fully overturn existing power structures and somehow get around the, the power that comes from being wealthy in the world. I just don't think it's the case. I think you're going to have a new generation of wealthy people, and they're going to be able to game whatever cool crypto anarchist system anybody comes up with. Rich people and powerful people are going to be able to game it. Yeah, you disconnected again for a sec, or it was me, I don't know. I was, I was but just could saying, you say that last sentence again? Yes, I think that in the long run, it doesn't matter how neat the crypto-anarchist system is that's developed, rich and powerful people are going to be able to game it in the long right. run. That's, I think that's just the way the world works. I don't like that, but I think that's the way the world works. Wouldn't it be like, if this thing is going to go global, you'll see an enormous, a massive redistribution of wealth. Yeah. 
like in the scenario that we are thinking about that we believe in is where basically you have this tipping point where fiat starts becoming worthless yeah. and everybody wants to save their value by going in Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, like right now that wouldn't work because you have a million coins but when you have one, right? And then, um, you know, and so like, you know, if if somebody like Jihan really believes in that and maybe he believes in himself that he can get, like, I mean, I, I don't know. This is something I sometimes tell myself. Uh, I want to believe in myself. It's not, I'm not going with a coin because I find the coin valuable. The coin becomes valuable because I'm working towards make it valuable which is a little bit of a different mindset hmm. right if I'm gonna put my ideas or whatever I can do towards making this thing successful I don't necessarily have to you know like and you know with the with the Bitcoin cash the value comes from there being so many people that believe in this ID that I find the most valuable all coming together working towards that that's where the value for me hmm. comes from right <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I think there's some truth to that. Um, I would say again in the conversation I had with Phil, part of the idea, the way he's thinking long term, is the wealth redistribution that might happen yeah. is uh, of historic levels, unprecedented levels, and it's going to result in like more technically minded people and geeks gaining a whole lot yeah, more yeah. power in the world, which is That's, an interesting dynamic. You imagine the world in which. More geeky people. That's what I've been saying. Yeah, yeah. hackers will be the new gods. That's what it, I've been saying. For yeah, a long kind time. of. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for, can, for better or worse, you know. And be the richest people in the world without anybody even knowing about it. Yeah, yeah. But on that very happy note, um, I do have to go. I have uh, I've okay. greatly enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, me as well. So I'm like, I always jump all over the place. Oh, no <laughs> I find it hard to like keep structure to what we were what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Do you have that interview with Phil Wilson? Do you have it online somewhere? Or I do. You... Yes. No. This is the infamous seven-hour interview it... that I dropped. Um, with, oh uh, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah that's all. Uh, that's too long for me. I mean, mm -hmm. I want to watch it, but yeah. seven hours, man. Oh, it's crazy. No, I know. Uh, so there's a few reasons for that. I won't go into now. Well, one quick thing. Do you, do you... Okay. One quick question, like, yeah. uh, we're both in this group, I think, where, 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 where Phil Wilson is now our new Satoshi or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, I left it. Uh, yeah, I left that group. Okay. Yeah. I find it interesting, which the people that are in there. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, do you think he had anything to do? Do you believe he had anything to do with Satoshi? Yeah, so in the, in the interview, um, the idea is... Well, part, part of the reason is I hope that other people, I think eventually people will comb through that interview and start editing out parts they find interesting. I just don't have the time to do it right now, uh, and I probably okay. won't actually. Um, Fair enough. But in the long run, I think people will because they're going to find Phil an, an interesting character. But in the beginning, I kind of explained my position um, where I, I put it, I, since talking to him and having more conversations, um, I would my current position is that I think Phil has information from the mind of Satoshi Nakamoto. That doesn't necessarily mean he Don't is... we all have that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, the only thing we know about Satoshi is the what he wrote about, like, it's uh, you just need a little bit of creativity to go beyond that. Like, I don't know, I could tell... I have an origin story in my head that I've completely made up. I could tell it could tell it to you yeah. someday. It would probably be very interesting. It would make sense and to have a little things yeah. that... People can check and 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 yeah. But I'm not gonna try fool people with it and just be like, well, this is a fantasy story. When I dream about being Satoshi, this is the story I made up in my head. Yeah, no, that's. I actually... feel the same way about Phil Wilson. And my question to you is, if you take CSW and Phil Wilson when they're talking about Bitcoin, who's talking rational about it? I'd say Phil Wilson is oh, talking yeah. a lot more rational oh, about okay. it. Okay, right? well, so the, so Phil's so I'd say Phil's an interesting guy. Um, uh, so he, he, Phil actually, if you listen to him, does not claim to be Satoshi Nakamoto. Right. He, he is self-aware enough to know that without proof, that doesn't get very far. And then he says, he released oh, an origins. He's crunky, right? And he released yeah. his origin story. Yeah. And basically he's saying CSW and he was like, they were all involved. Like he wrote this whole origin story, right? He claims that yeah. he has this insider knowledge that he knows what happened and who Satoshi was. Uh, I wouldn't put it that way. 
you, you, could, you could put it that way. I wouldn't put it that way. Here, here's what I'd say. The origin I haven't story, read it, so I don't know the whole, I, like I, I have only seen a tiny bit of it, yeah. but I wasn't very interested in yet another origin story. I so. wasn't either, in fact. Um, I, I, I saw it when it came out a few years ago, and I thought, oh, this is nonsense. Uh, because what I, change your mind? So I didn't understand. I, I sped read, uh, which I tend to do, and when you speed read, you overlook important information. Um, when I read it the first time, I thought it was somebody, tr like there were quotes this person said this, this person said that. There's no way somebody's going to remember these quotes. That's hogwash. Then I don't exactly know what happened, which caused me. I think maybe one of my friends had talked to Scranti, and I'm not exactly sure, but I reread it. And um, I, at the beginning, he says, this is, this is not actually what happened. This is my way of telling a story to reconstruct what happened, because the memories are fairly fuzzy for various reasons. Um, did I lose you again? Or your connection. Yeah, it's all right. Oh, it might be my connection. Not, yeah, I'm my things sure. are going off. Must be my connection. Okay. okay. Um, so in the beginning, he says, "This is not what happened. This is just my way of telling the story." Y yes. Um, and suddenly I went, "Oh, oh okay. Well, this is uh, this is interesting." So, uh, so here's my summarization from my perspective. Um, there are certain things that you learn about how the world works when solving problems that other people haven't been able to solve. And I have a little bit of inside knowledge on this because some of my work in philosophy has actually been able to solve things that other people haven't been able to solve. There are particular okay. patterns of thinking and, and conclusions that you draw about other people's ways of thinking that Phil has. So he actually correctly identifies some of the thought process that would go into creating something like Bitcoin. Doesn't mean that he is, but uh, he has is Satoshi, but he right. understands some things that nobody else would say. Okay, and, so to give an example of, of an insight that uh, that would be a reason okay. why Satoshi designed something like how it is, because it came out of a way of thinking, and okay, he but, is talking about that way of well, thinking. Well, it's a so it's a. We could, we could have a whole conversation about, about this, but um, so one technical example would be his discussion of a timestamp server versus a chrono stamp server. And uh, in the, this is, it's breaking up again. Yeah, breaking up again, huh? Yeah, okay. Uh, say again? Um, so, there, so there's many examples. One, so one technical one is his difference between a, a timestamp server and a Kronos stamp server. So he, he explains how timestamping servers can't work in Bitcoin. Um, and people were trying to use, trying to make timestamping servers. In fact, even that lingo, timestamping server, is still the way that people think about some of the, some of the phenomena taking place in Bitcoin. Like, like for example... Um, well, just the resolution is, the resolution is not super fine and it, it changes. No, no, no. But, so, uh, oh, so, so the idea that, so in what order do blocks get added to the blockchain? And there was an idea that that actual time, like, you know, right now it says 429, like that pit, bit of information gets added to the blockchain, and then what follows it is 430. That's a normal way of thinking about chronological progression. Right. But so, that doesn't happen because sometimes yeah. the timestamps in blocks, the, I mean, yeah. it's causality that's in the blocks. That's right. what so, it is. It's just the causality because well, well, hang you on, need hang, to have... Hang on, hang on. So I know that's not what happens. So this is okay. why I think his way of thinking about it is very interesting. He, he, what he's trying to document is part of the, re, the, the faulty ways of reasoning to explain why Bitcoin wasn't created. Is because people had overlooked this. They're looking. They're looking. They're thinking things the wrong way. So he he came up with he calls the the Chronos stamp server the chronological okay. ordering of things, where it's actually not the time that matters. What matters is ultimately the order. Uh, this is a this is a very f an interesting uh, little different way of thinking about a way. If you could, if you didn't have the concept of the blockchain that you're so familiar with, and you're the one trying to Create it. It's subtle little things like that. But why is that a special insight? Because like Bitcoin works as a timestamping service because you have this chronology in it. If you have these things chronological and you can link them to some real event yeah. that happened, then it just establish some causality. Sure. And if you if you take that over a long enough times 
time stand if your you know uh-huh. your granularity of it becomes big enough over weeks of, or, 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 or a couple of days or a week yeah, yeah. then you can say with a certain amount of certainty that this happened back then yeah, sure. I, I, I would recommend just reading reading the article. Um, I'm just trying to give an example of if it's the case you're trying to build a blockchain concept with the idea of having actual times uh, being a necessary part of it, that fails. You can't do it because people can game the system and there's going to be disagreement about what time it actually yeah. is. But if you were to construct... Was Satoshi system, really... What, where does it say Satoshi was trying to do that? So, so if it's the case that Phil, let's okay. say, is part of the mind of Satoshi Nakamoto, the, the, when you talk to him, the point in writing the article is not to say, hey, look at the I'm Satoshi Nakamoto. It's an attempt to document the thought process involved okay. in creating right. Bitcoin technology, as one would do if one actually made this technology and you don't necessarily care about being seen as the creator. The thing that right. is actually important is to explain to the world the way of solving the problem. So, okay. he, so he goes through many, many different ways of thinking about Bitcoin and why, the, why other people were not able to think of it in this particular way and why thinking okay. about it in this particular way solves the problem. He gives another analogy, which is really interesting, about um, blockchains being like a strip of triangles. Um, and, and there's a way, his, part of his background is in like video graphics. And there's a way in which triangles um, create a strip in a particular um, fashion where it's a really nice analogy to how blockchains work. How you can have one structure build on the next structure or build on the next structure by incorporating two of the vertices of the previous structure. And you can't actually change one of the earlier triangles without fundamentally changing the order of the whole thing. Which is, this is the analogy to like, if you have a hash of the previous block in the next block, that implies you can't. Like that's a necessary feature is that in order to build on part two, part three, part four, you have to have the hash of the of the previous block. So it's analogies right. like that which demonstrate okay. a type of uh, insight. Yeah, it's an insight and a way of thinking about Bitcoin technology that one would expect the creator of the system to have. And it's but case. Why do you case. think he is still like? Why do you like? What if you meet three or four more people that are able to also have these insights just based on their own understanding of Bitcoin, not necessarily yeah. them being part of the creation of it? Sure, sure, sure. That's it. So because so, you can work backwards and you well, can figure a whole bunch of stuff out that way. And you think you can. Uh, I don't know if that's actually true. There's, so, but so. it only makes sense to you because you understand the insights. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Satoshi really felt this way about it. You'd have no idea, but it makes logical sense because you have this sure. insight and it explains certain things. So, so as I said, I think that Phil has information that Satoshi had. Now, there's a whole ton of other information. There's a very, very long piece, the Bitcoin origin story. Um, there's a whole ton of other information there. The reason I personally find many parts of the story persuasive is because in the process of making um, advancements in philosophy, big advancements, there are very simple thought processes that are overlooked by the people in the industry. So, for example, he talks about why academics could never have solved the relevant problems to get Bitcoin. While they're all barking up the wrong trees, they make fundamental errors in the way that they're approaching the problem. He talks about some of the dynamics in the social community, um, yeah. where like your in, point is, he's saying valuable things about. There's some value in there in his insights. He, yes, there are definitely some value in the insights, um, but what yeah. I'm specifically saying is there is an incredibly persuasive perspective that he writes from that I actually believe is the perspective of Satoshi. It doesn't mean he's Satoshi. He, there are other ways that one could have access to that information, especially if one have ac- has access to, let's say, emails that are exchanged between the developers of uh, Bitcoin. It might right. be possible that somebody stumbled across an archive of or stumbled across an archive of something like this and then created a story after the fact. That's also very possible. There are many... I don't, yeah. I don't think Satoshi ever was trying to keep certain discussions secret that he had with developers. I don't think there was any hidden insights that Satoshi didn't that didn't share. I think that's completely, completely incorrect. 
I think, I, in fact, I think the vast majority, so here's the other part, here's one of the pieces of the puzzle. Um, people who are experts in a particular field tend to be incredibly dogmatic and incredibly defensive. And the creation of Bitcoin makes a bunch of mathematicians and computer scientists look like idiots. Thousands. Because they weren't able to solve the problem and they confidently concluded, therefore, the problem couldn't be solved. Satoshi was never very defensive. No, no. He just I, moved on. No, I know. That's what I'm saying is that I, I don't. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm not calling Satoshi an expert. I'm, I'm putting expert in quotation marks. Uh, Self described experts, formal uh, people who have academic training, this type, people who work in this space for a long time, they are going to have every psychological self interest not to conclude that. A man just solved a problem that you were convinced was unsolvable. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I just wanted to make this yeah. the remark that from Satoshi's writings, he was not, and from the fact he remained anonymous, this was not a person that oh, was yes. like, oh, yeah. and this is this is what this is one big part of the Bitcoin mystery. This is like, what person doesn't want credit for an invention like this? Phil like, Wilson. do you know? Do you know? Do you, okay. Do you know any invention in the world that we don't know of who invented it? Like, imagine if we didn't know who invented the rocket or this. Like, if these things well, go so global and nobody knows who invented it, like, I mean, well, Satoshi, so if, Satoshi knew what he was building. If you if you listen, he must to have the, believed in it. But if you listen to the story, right, as we've talked about, this is a project that has massive implications on nation states, right? This right. might be it. So so it may have. If you've listened to his particular story, he said because he might have been the creator of the system, it was a black project from the beginning. So he had every incentive to cover up all of his traces because it's very possible that he, I mean, it definitely would be the case that if it were proven that he was Satoshi Nakamoto, um, he would have a target on his back in more ways than one. So he wasn't, right? So that's part of the reason why he would want to be anonymous. And there's other reasons well, too, yeah. Yeah, but that's exactly why it was so self-defeating for CSW to to come out and claim that he's Satoshi, I'm like, do you want to have your family kidnapped? Yeah. No, I mean, as, soon, I, as soon as the wrong guy starts believing you have a million bitcoins, you have a huge issue there with everybody. I don't think it's clear at all that Craig's approach. Well, so, okay. I, I, this is the last thing I, I, I can say. Okay, but, I'm uh, sorry. It's all right. This is a good conversation. I actually have to yeah, talk yeah. to somebody publicly about um, my thoughts on Phil, so this is good. Um, a huge piece of the puzzle, which is put into place for me with Phil's story is the explanation of Craig Wright. Um, and the reason Craig Wright is a problem to explain is because of Gavin Andreessen, uh, John Matonis, and Ian Grit, and, and, and some others too, who claim that he's signed important um, things in front of them. Um, if it weren't the case that there were legit people in this space who believed that Craig Wright was Satoshi Nakamoto, I think we could confidently dismiss him. But given that we can't do that, uh, he needs an explanation, and Phil's story is the perfect explanation. In fact, he's an amazing bam he's an amazing bamboozler. Uh, That's how I feel about so, it. So, so, so I put it this way: it may be that he has and what is you necessary. You said it yourself that we're a little naive in this space. So I think somebody like Gavin Andreessen is just a little too naive. It's possible. I mean, it's definitely possible. Um, but it's, there's another possibility here, which is that Craig has what it takes to bring a project like this into existence. It takes a little bit of craziness. And if you want an explanation for how some things that he says are quite good and quite insightful, um, and even he might have f some fundamental information that other people are just not coming around to, like like the so computation, like the computation. Of, right. Say what? Computation of what? The, the computational ability of the Bitcoin system. What can what can Bitcoin actually do? Right. This okay. is a question. So, do you feel like he he's doing good things with Bitcoin SV then? Oh, that's a whole different is, thing. I don't, I don't have enough time to talk about that. I really am very torn okay. about um, SV. Very, very torn. Um, but okay. to, to answer, to, to complete this, he, Craig strikes me as somebody who, like 50% of what he says is complete, utter horseshit. Uh, there's like 25% that's probably pretty good. And there's like 10% that's like, ooh, that's really, really deep. And if that were actually correct, that would imply... A level of knowledge about Bitcoin that nobody else has. Ah, but now I have an explanation for why that's the case. Craig can actually be both part of Satoshi Nakamoto, have the, some keys of Satoshi Nakamoto, and be technically fraudulent. No. Oh, yeah. Have you ever heard about an amplified DDoS attack? Yeah. 
An amplified DDoS attack is you send a tiny, tiny bit of data to one service and you redirect it to your target, but it gets amplified. Yeah. So sometimes you have 50, like if you can turn one byte into 50 or 100 bytes, you amplify your attack. And Craig does exactly the same thing, but just with your mind. No. He talks with very, very, very smart people and he makes them do his thinking for them. No. They start thinking about these things and like, maybe, maybe he means it this way. Oh, wow. Then it's very insightful. That's, some, some at least time, that's how I that's feel. That's some about percentage it. of it. So how do you explain his claim that Bitcoin is effectively Turing complete, which is a very different thing than saying Bitcoin is Turing complete. To say that Bitcoin, so all of the relevant calculations that can but be done. PowerPoint is effectively Turing complete. Yeah, well, I mean, the concept of Turing completeness is kind of silly. What, how, what is the what's the what's the what's the context? Here, why why does why. it matter? Be, here's why. Because like here's why it matters. Because forever, up until I don't know when that talk he had with Nick Zabo happened. Uh, 2015. That's 20, the first. Up until 2015, the experts in the space were communicating that smart contracts of X complexity were not possible on Bitcoin because of the scripting language. That's what they were saying. So he yeah, was, and you still have to make a bridge if you want to. Sure, yeah. you can make the scripting language loop, but you have to put something on top of it to make the scripting uh, language loop. At the time, everybody was saying, this is the stupidest idea ever. This is definitely wrong. All the experts agree. You can't do it. Because the scripting language doesn't loop itself, you can't do all of these calculations. This is silly. And it turns out that for the reasons he, de well, for the reasons he described, he was correct. Now, he says it the wrong way. He says it a bunch of silly ways. But, there have but been even if yeah, even if you could do these calculations in such a way that they're totally not efficient and they're completely useless, what does it matter? It matters because it's a signal to the rest of the people observing the space that here's somebody saying incorrect information that is mocked by the rest of the entire industry. It turns out to be right. I don't think well, that's maybe, coincidence. Maybe the people are the other people are saying, well, I mean, sure, technically, theoretically speaking, you can do that, but that's you don't get any benefits out of that's it. That's not what they were saying. Well, I this, mean, this like is uh, this is a change of the that's story. That's what I would be saying. Like, I, somebody like Nick Zabo, I don't understand how he writes all those brilliant things about money and stuff, and then he goes with BTC and a low block yeah. site, which makes which makes no sense unless you want to have a, a settlement system again, but then you're going backwards in time and you've first, yeah. you're reinventing gold and now you're inventing the paper IOUs that you used to and the gold doesn't move. That's not going forward, that's going backwards in time to the to like, the old system. Like I, I agree with you. I think Nick Zab, I, I, look, my perspective on experts. He likes gold a lot, apparently. He, if he would have invented, I mean, didn't he invent something that he called bit gold instead of no, Bitcoin? He, had, he from wants. my understanding, he didn't invent it. He just wrote, he, he wrote, a little, a couple of things about it. Oh, he no wants. He like they like gold. They want gold again. Right. So, so, so my perspective on experts in general is that they are fundamentally mistaken about the basics of their own field. There's a reason for this. It's because discovering the basics of one's own field is incredibly hard, and it takes um, a great deal of philosophical analysis. So, Phil's story is a explanation. Uh, is it is a story of how the person that is not seeking the fame. Uh, worked with a megalomaniac to create a system that the experts could not have brought into existence. Um, and I, I think that's very compelling. But I must, I, I'm happy to talk about this um, later, but I, I, Some I must... Some more time. Yes, I'm... I, I, okay, yes. and then my next video, I want to talk a little bit about... If you're going to talk about Phil Wilson, yeah. I make a deal with you. I want to talk a little bit about John Nash and Ideal Money. Okay. Because I have some some interesting things about John Nash that I want to share as I've well. I've heard some interesting and, ideas about him, yes, as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll start reading the Scronti story then, and yeah. I'll watch some of your video. Great. And if you look a little bit into John Nash, then maybe we'd have some very interesting stuff to talk about. All right, all right. Sounds good. It's a pleasure speaking with you. But I want to say one more thing. My the whole I didn't want to get. I don't want to. I really don't want to go into these topics anymore. Like this. <laughs> And I, I think they're very self-defeating in a way. They're very interesting. It's yeah. very uh, attracting to people. It gets has a grip on your mind that is so strong. Yeah. But it's like self-defeating. It keeps you in place. It doesn't really move you forwards. Maybe. I mean, well, we'll just have to leave it there. But uh, that, we'll okay. pick up there for another time. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Steve, uh, for your time. And uh, have a nice day. Yes, you as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.